The Lives of the Saints, by the Reverend Alban Butler, taken from the fourth edition, published in 1954. February 26th, St. Alexander, Confessor, Patriarch of Alexandria. St. Alexander succeeded St. Achilles in the See of Alexandria in 313, he was a man of apostolic doctrine in life, mild, affable, and exceedingly charitable to the poor, and full of faith, zeal, and fervor. He assumed to the sacred ministry chiefly those who had first sanctified themselves in holy solitude, and was happy in the choice of bishops throughout all Egypt. The devil, enraged to see the havoc made in his usurped empire over mankind by the disrepute idolatry was generally fallen into, used his utmost endeavors to repair the loss to his infernal kingdom by procuring the establishment of a most impious heresy. Arius, a priest of Alexandria, was his principal instrument for that purpose. This heresiarch was well versed in profane literature, was a subtle dialectician, had an exterior show of virtue and an insinuating behavior but was a monster of pride, vainglory, ambition, envy, and jealousy. He joined Militius, the bishop of Lycopolis, in the beginning of his schism against St. Peter, our saint's predecessor, in 300. But quitting that party after some time, St. Peter was so well satisfied of the sincerity of his repentance that he ordained him deacon. Soon after, Arius discovered his turbulent spirit in accusing his archbishop and raising disturbances in favor of the Militians. This obliged St. Peter to excommunicate him, nor could he ever be induced to revoke that sentence. But his successor, St. Achilas, upon his repentance, admitted him to his communion, ordained him priest, and made him curate of the church of Bacales, one of the quarters of Alexandria. Giving way to spite and envy on seeing St. Alexander preferred before him to the see of Alexandria, he became his mortal enemy, and as the saint's life and conduct were irreproachable, all his endeavors to oppose him were leveled at his doctrine, in opposition to which the heresiarch denied the divinity of Christ. This error he at first taught only in private, but having, about the year 319, gained followers to support him, he boldly advanced his blasphemies in his sermons, affirming with Abion, Aremus, and Theodotus that Christ was not truly God, adding what no heretic had before asserted in such a manner, that the Son was a creature and made out of nothing, that there was a time when he did not exist, and that he was capable of sinning with other such impieties. Arius engaged in his errors two other curates of the city, a great many virgins, twelve deacons, seven priests, and two bishops. One Colothus, another curate of Alexandria, and many others declaimed loudly against these blasphemies. The heretics were called Arians, and these called the Catholics Coluthians. St. Alexander, who was one of the mildest of men, first made use of soft and gentle methods to recover Arius to the truth, and endeavored to gain him by sweetness and exhortations. Several were offended at his lenity, and Colutus carried his resentment so far as to commence a schism. But this was soon at an end, and the author of it returned to the Catholic communion. But St. Alexander, finding Arius' party increase, and all his endeavors to reclaim him ineffectual, he summoned him to appear in an assembly of his clergy, where, being found obstinate and incorrigible, he was excommunicated together with his adherents. This sentence of excommunication the saint confirmed soon after, about the end of the year 320, in a council at Alexandria, at the head of near 100 bishops, at which Arius was also present. Alexander wrote to the Pope, St. Sylvester, and, in a circular letter, to the other bishops of the church, giving them an account of Arius' heresy and condemnation. Arius, Eusebius, and many others wrote to our saint, begging that he would take off his censors. The Emperor Constantine also exhorted him by letter to a reconciliation with Arius, and sent it by the great Osius to Alexandria, with express orders to procure information of the state of the affair. The deputy returned to the emperor better informed of the heresiarch's impiety and malice and the zeal, virtue, and prudence of St. Alexander. And, having given him a just and faithful account of the matter, convinced him of the necessity of a general council as the only remedy adequate to the growing evil and capable of restoring peace to the church. St. Alexander had already sent him the same advice in several letters. That prince, accordingly, by letters of respect, invited the bishops to Nice in Bithynia, and defrayed their expenses. They assembled in the imperial palace of Nice on the 19th of June in 325, being 318 in number, the most illustrious prelates of the church, among whom were many glorious confessors of the faith. The principal were our saint, St. Euthasius, 
Patriarch of Antioch, St. Macarius of Jerusalem, Sicilian, Archbishop of Carthage, St. Paphnutius, St. Potamon, St. Paul of Nicosia, St. James of Nisibilis, and more. St. Sylvester could not come in person by reason of his great age, but he sent his legates who presided in his name. The Emperor Constantine entered the council without guards, nor would he sit till he was desired by the bishops, says Eusebius. Theodoret says that he asked the bishops leave before he would enter. The blasphemies of Arius, who was himself present, were convassed for several days. Marcellus of Ancyria and St. Athanasius, whom St. Alexander had brought with him, and whom he treated with the greatest esteem, discovered all the impiety they contained and confuted the Arians with invincible strength. The heretics, fearing the indignation of the council, used a great deal of dissimulation in admitting the Catholic terms. The fathers, to exclude all their subtleties, declared the son consubstantial to the father, which they inserted in the profession of their faith, called the Nicene Creed, which was drawn up by Osius, and to which all subscribed except a small number of Arians. At first they were seventeen, but Eusebius of Caesarea received the creed that day following, as did all the others except five, namely Eusebius of Nicomedia, Theognus of Nice, Maris of Chalcedon, Theonus and Secundus of Libya, the two bishops who had first joined Arius. Arius, Theonus, and Secundus, with some Egyptian priests, were banished by the order of Constantine, and Elicrium was the place of their exile. The council received Miletius and his schismatical ad adherents upon their repentance, but they afterwards relapsed into their schism, and part of them joined the Arians. The council added twenty canons of discipline, and was closed about the th 25th of August. Constantine gave all the prelates a magnificent entertainment, and dismissed them with great presents to their respective sees. St. Alexander, after this triumph of the faith, returned to Alexandria, where, after having recommended St. Athanasius for his successor, he died in 326 on the 26th of February, on which day he is mentioned in the Roman Martyrology. A true disciple of Christ, by a sincere spirit of humility and distrust in himself, is, as it were, naturally inclined to submission to all authority appointed by God, in which he finds his peace, security, and joy. This happy disposition of his soul is his secure fence against the illusions of self-sufficiency and blind pride, which easily betrays men into the most fatal errors. On the contrary, pride is a spirit of revolt and independence. He who is possessed with this devil is fond of his own conceits, self-confident and obstinate. This is the true portraiture of Arius and other heresiarchs and firebrands of the universe. Can we sufficiently detest jealousy and pride, the fatal source of so great evils? Do we not discover by fatal symptoms that we ourselves harbor this monster in our breasts? Should the eye be jealous that the ear hears, and disturb the functions of this or the other senses, instead of regarding them as its own, and enjoying their mutual advantage and comfort, what confusion would ensue? <laughs>